Good morning, everybody. Before we get started, you can get, you stand up. <laughs> uh, I just want to let you guys know that uh, we are all wearing blue, but Holly has decided to wear a different color this morning because they found out the, that they are having a little girl. So, so act surprised when you see the Facebook reveal. Everybody still comment and act surprised. But she's going to read our, let's stand together. She reads our call to worship this morning. Good morning, everyone. Our scripture today is from Matthew 2, verses 2 through 9. And he began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Well, amen. Well, turn around and find somebody that you don't recognize and tell them how happy you are to see them this morning. Ain't 
You guys have a seat. Good morning, Burlington Baptist Church. Good, Good to see everyone here in the house of the Lord this morning. And I hope you're here for worship. Got a smile on your face because we got a lot to be thankful for. Amen. Amen. Today, I just wanted to draw your attention to a couple of things. First of all, if you are our guest, a special welcome to you. It's just so great to have you here joining us for worship. Whether you're online or you're here in the house, uh, we want to hear from you. So we just ask one of thing, or one of two things from you. If you're online, you can leave a little message in the comment section. Let us know that you're watching. But if you're here in the house, if you can just scan the QR code that should be in one of the seats in front of you, fill out that information so we'd have a little bit uh, uh, get to know you information uh, for the future so we can reach out to you. What would be better than that is on your way out today, if you could stop by the welcome desk and just introduce yourself. Um, we just want to be able to uh, get a place, a face, and a name and, and get to know you and meet you, and that would be just a wonderful thing for us. If there's anything that you need while you are here, we just remind you that we have a wonderful group of people that are out there under our First Impressions team. They'll be able to point you in any direction, anything that you might need. Don't hesitate to ask them a question. A lot of things going on in the life of our church. This week on Wednesday night, one of the biggest community things that we do as an outreach uh, during the year is Candy on the Corner. Happens back here. I told them in the first service, I said, if you want to see a mass of humanity <laughs> grabbing for candy, and that's just the adults, then you want to come and see this. It is a, it's a real blessing to us. We actually have a lot of people from the Burlington area, from Boone County, come over and they're a part of that, bring their kids over. It's a nice, safe place for them to go through, and it just gives us an opportunity just to meet and greet those people. If you don't have a car that you're going to be passing out candy in, still, you're welcome to come up and just meet and greet people. Just introduce them, invite them to come to church. That would be a wonderful thing. If you really want to see it from a bird's eye view, I will even let you by the big window out there in the back, and you can sit out there and look at all the craziness that's going on down there. Because I know some of you wait around until after it's cleared up and you go around and pick up all the loose candy off the ground. That's kind of disgusting, but I know that you do it, okay? But Danny, I, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to out you. I didn't mean to out you. Yeah, okay. he, he does. He has a whole list of candy he knows kids won't eat, and then he goes up and asks them for it. So he usually ends up with a bigger bag than all of us. But uh, come and be a part of that. Also, just a reminder that next Sunday is our food pantry uh, emphasis day. And what we're going to be doing is, is we're going to be gathering the things that are listed in the newsletter. If you don't know what they are, our newsletter out there has a whole list of things that we are looking for the food pantry, especially in this season when uh, things are getting a lot higher price. I know you guys are going to the store. People are under the gun a little bit about being able to make ends meet. We want to make sure that we are supplied and ready for the need that uh, God brings our way. So um, if you can check that list out and next Sunday, we'll have collection points through uh, the church, probably one upstairs, one down in the lower level. And that way we can fill up the food pantry and be ready for all the things that we might encounter for the needs. And you guys are so wonderful about it. There's no doubt that we're going to do it. It's just that uh, just a friendly reminder that next Sunday is that emphasis. If you're here as a guest or whether you're a uh, goer here, a regular attender at Burlington Baptist Church, today is a special day just because it's the day of our Father. And today as we gather in the house, we want to make sure that all of our praises that are sung are lifting up to Him. And He knows that that's an offering from us. 
We're blessed with the word that Harold's going to break in just a few minutes, and hopefully that's going to penetrate our hearts and change us in a mighty way. But as we get ready for worship, I'm going to ask you to join me for prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the day. It's a beautiful fall day outside, and you've blessed us again. And Father, there are so many things that we bring into this place with us today and all the noise of the outside world. And I just ask that you help us kind of take that out of our way so we can hear you speaking to us today. Father, we ask that you let your spirit just move among us as Harold brings the word in just a few minutes and let that word penetrate us and change us in a mighty way. Allow the words that we sing in these praise times not to be just songs that we're singing just out of habit, but they're actually offerings to you to let you know how wonderful and how much we appreciate your love for us. Father, all this wouldn't be possible without your son, Jesus Christ, and your wonderful plan to make sure that we draw close to you. So let us hold on to that this week when we have the opportunity here in the community. Let us be bold and reach out to those people that don't know Jesus Christ and just let them know that there are people here that care for them. Let us continue to be the light here in Burlington in Boone County, in this part of Kentucky. Let us not ever wane from the fact that we're here to serve you and to share your story. So bless us in this time as we go through a time of preparedness and just soften our hearts today to hear you. We pray all these things in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Can you stand together with us one more time as we sing this morning? Surely my God is the 
strength of my soul. Your love defends me. Your love defends me. And when I feel like I'm all alone, your love defends me. Your love defends me. Surely my God is the strength of my soul. Your love defends me. Your love defends me. And when I feel like I'm all alone, your love defends me. Your love defends me. Amen. Amen. You guys have a seat. Well, I asked him in the early service, I said, is anyone in here glad? That, that Christ continually pursues you? I am, yeah. Well, somebody is. That's good. That's good. <laughs> well, I got to thinking about it because you know, sometimes when he's after me, he's got to be really, really fast because I like to get way out there sometimes. But uh, I got to thinking about this song, and uh, that's what this song is about, just Christ kind of coming after you. But he's so fast, sometimes he's waiting on us when we get there. So we're going to sing about that this week. Every time I try to make it on my own Every time I try to stand and start to fall All those lonely roads that I traveled on There was Jesus When the life I built came crashing to the ground when the friends I had were nowhere to be found I couldn't see it then, but I can see it now There was Jesus In the waiting, in the searching In the healing and the hurting Like a blessing buried in the broken pieces Every minute, every moment, where I've been and where I'm going, even when I didn't know it, I couldn't see it. There was Jesus. For this man who needs amazing kind of grace, for forgiveness at a price I couldn't pay. I'm not perfect, so I thank God every day. There was Jesus. There was Jesus. In the waiting, in the searching, in the healing and the hurting, like a blessing buried in the broken pieces. Every minute, every moment, where I've been, shadows of the alleys there was Jesus in the fire in the flood there was Jesus always is and always was no I'll never walk alone walk you're always there In the healing and the hurting, like a blessing buried in the broken pieces. Every minute, every moment, where I've been and where I'm going, even when I didn't know it, I couldn't see it. There was Jesus. 
Amen. We want you to encounter Jesus this morning. Thank you, praise team, for that. Manny, we got lots of guests out here this morning. We're always glad to see you. Thank you for joining us this morning. Danny knows most of the guests we have sometimes, but most of them this morning, they don't know who Danny is. And so introduce yourself to Danny when you, get, when you leave this morning and myself. Uh, we're in a series called healthy, Building a Healthy Church. This morning we're going to talk about relationships and responsibilities. Before we get into the Word, I'm going to be in Matthew 18, but uh, before then, I'm, I heard about Fred and Edna. Fred and Edna went to the State Fair every year, and every year, Fred would say to Edna, Edna, I'd like to ride that airplane. And every year, Edna would say, I know, Fred, but that airplane ride costs $20, and $20 is $20. Well, one year, Fred and Edna went to the fair, and Fred said, Edna, I'm 71 years old, and if I don't ride that airplane soon, I may never get another chance. Edna said, Fred, that airplane ride costs $20, and $20 is $20. Well, that particular year, the pilot overheard them talking and said, Folks, I'll make a deal with you. I'll take both of you up for a ride, and if you stay quiet the whole ride, don't say anything. I won't charge you anything. But if you say one word, it's going to cost $20. And so they agreed, and they went up, and the pilot does all kinds of twists and turns and rows and dives, and he didn't hear a word. So he did it all again, and he did all these things, and... Uh, Still not a word. So the, they land, and the pilot uh, turned to Fred and said, By golly, I, I did everything I could to get you all to yell out, but you didn't. And Fred said, Well, I was going to say something when Edna fell out, but 20 bucks is 20 bucks. <laughs> anyway, we're talking about building healthy relationships. We we talked about our responsibility to safeguard the unity of the church. And, this, and, and last week we talked about serving the ministries. This morning we're going to talk about relationships and responsibilities within the church, particularly submitting to corrective discipline from the church. So Matthew 18, and what we find is some of the most profitable instructions in all the scriptures. Let, let me kind of set the stage. This is Jesus' first instructions really I think to the church which is extremely important it's not optional and yet so often it's neglected and so we want to consider Jesus's instructions this morning figure out how to honor his word in his body and it's not easy and we need his help and so let's dive in here Matthew 18 I'd love for you to stand and we'll honor God's word together this is going to be a two-part series I, I couldn't get the whole I couldn't get it all in in one sermon. We didn't want to be here past 12. And so this is part one. You've got to come back next week for part two. Verse 15, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. If he does not listen, take one or two others along with you, that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Let's, let's pray. Father, we come to your word and we want to honor it. Uh, we need your help. We pray your Holy Spirit would help us to understand. We pray that the voice of the Spirit would, uh, would be loud and strong this morning, that we would have ears to hear, that we would have receptive hearts, that we would be doers of your word and not hearers only. And we acknowledge your need, our need for help. And so we pray you would provide that this morning. Lord, I pray that if there's a person here outside of a relationship with Jesus, that they would just be reminded today of how much you loved them and what you did for them on the cross. And I pray that some might turn from their sins and be saved today. Lord, we would rejoice in that and give you all the praise. And so we pray you would speak through your word this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Here's the context. Jesus is teaching his disciples, and uh, these are instructions that we need to heed as followers of Jesus. Uh, we're sinners, and our sin has consequences. We know that sin separates us from God. He's holy. We're sinners. That's a big problem. We know John 3.16, don't we? 
God so loved the world that he sent Jesus. And Jesus came on a divine rescue mission. Jesus was sent. He was born of a virgin. We're familiar with that. Jesus lived a sinless life. And then Jesus went to the cross. And on the cross, he paid the punishment for our sins. He, he died as a substitute. He died in our place. He died. He was buried. On the third day, he arose again. Church, he arose in victory over death and the grave and over sin. And he invites us to turn from our sins. The Bible word for that is repent. And to, to trust in him and to follow him. And he offers to forgive our sins and give us the gift of eternal life. John 1.12 says, But to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. And so in other words, through faith, we come into the family of God. At the end of the service, as I do every week, I, I'm going to invite you to turn from your sins and believe upon Jesus and believe upon His sacrifice for you on the cross and to be saved and to be part of the, the family of God, to become a brother and sister in Christ. And this series is about the, the family of God, the church, sometimes referred to as uh, the bride of Christ. As such... Jesus wants us to live in right relationships with one another, and so he gives us some instructions. Now, one thing that's kind of interesting is, is I've noticed as I've gone through this series that uh, our church covenant actually addresses the various callings that we have as church members. So our, our church covenant says that we will engage to watch over one another in brotherly love, to remember one another in prayer. So we're supposed to be praying for one another. To be slow to take offense, but always ready for reconciliation and mindful of the rules of our Savior to secure it without delay. So in our church covenant, there are these references to exercising care and watchfulness and accountability within the body. And yet we so often neglect Biblical instructions and even church instructions. Now, actually, when, when some people come looking for a church uh, and they want a church that's true to the Word of God, that actually loves God, loves the, the people of God, we, you know one of the questions that they ask sometimes? They ask the question, do you guys practice church discipline? Do you guys practice church discipline? And we might say, wow, why, why would somebody ask that question? Well, the answer to that question reveals some things pretty quickly. First of all, it tells you that the church has a high view of Scripture because Jesus has given us some instructions about church discipline. Second, it would tell you that the church loves holiness and purity and will strive towards holiness and purity. Number three, it tells you that it's a church that loves its members enough to go to them when there is sin and when there is a need for such discipline. And number four, it tells you that it's a church that's more interested in pleasing God than it is in pleasing man. Now, I don't particularly like the question because as a pastor, it, it's hard to answer it in the affirmative. But here's the truth. I, I've spent considerable time studying these instructions, and I've tried to help people understand what the Lord tells us to do. And I, I've tried even myself to, uh, to live this out. I, I want this to be a healthy church. And so this is such an important bit of instructions for us. And I think that if we clearly understand the Lord's instructions, then we will see that it is a beautiful design and plan. God has a, a beautiful plan for His body, His, His church. And so let's begin by considering some of the, the protest against what sometimes is referred to corrective discipline or church discipline. There are some who would protest against it. Let me just share some of the protests. The first protest is that corrective discipline is legalistic. And some will say, well, it's, it's just not consistent with your emphasis upon grace and, and, and the love of God. It's, it's judgmental. Now listen, I want to do everything I can. I, I don't want to encourage legalism. I, I, I tasted a lot of legalism when I was young. I, I I don't want to be legalistic or judgmental, but here's the, the response to that. Corrective discipline is, is loving. Loving. Let's consider your children. Is it legalistic or is it loving for you to discipline your children? 
If your children are out there playing in the road, is it legalistic or loving for you to go out there and get them out of harm's way? It's a loving thing to do, isn't it? Hebrews 12, 11 says, For the moment all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. And so it, it's painful sometimes, but it has an end result that is, that is righteous and good. Let me add some important observations. The, the term discipline and disciple come from the same Latin source. The source of the word has to do with education and instructions. The, the Old Testament word musar and the, the New Testament word padea uh, set forth the ideal of education backed by force or education with some teeth with it. And so Hebrews 12, 11 makes it clear that, that discipline, education, it's not always pleasant. But the Bible also tells us in Hebrews 12, 6, the Lord disciplines the one he loves. And so I want the Lord's discipline in my life when I need it. I, I want him to correct me and lead me in the paths of righteousness. Uh, that's kind of verification that we're his children when he does that. So corrective discipline is loving rather than legalistic. Protest number two, people will leave the church. If you confront people in their sin, they will just leave and go to another church. Well, my response to that is Jesus said, I'll build the church. And it's His church. And if it's His church and He has given us instructions for His church, we're just to follow Him. Protest number three, sin is a personal matter. Now listen, we're, we're all sinners. If I said who's sinners in here, I hope all of us would raise our hands. We're all sinners. We sin. We have an opportunity to confess our sins, to repent of that sin, to turn from it, and praise the Lord when we do. God desires for us to confess our sins to Him and turn from our sins. Jesus here is not talking about the person who sins and confesses the sin. Again, we're all in that boat. We're all sinners. There's no need to confront someone who confesses their sin. Corrective discipline is not for those who who confess their sins. It's for those who will not confess and repent of their sins. In these instructions, who's Jesus referring to? Well, notice verse 15. If your brother sins. Here's the truth of Scripture. Sin is a family matter. Sin is a church matter. And I know some will argue, well, do not judge. Yeah, we're not to judge the motives of others. But here's what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 5, 12. He said, what have I to do with judging outsiders? To the church, what do I have to do with them? And the answer to that is nothing. But then he goes on and says, is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? And the answer to that question is absolutely. And he describes it in 1 Corinthians 5. There was some immorality in the church, and he encourages the church to deal with that. Peter says, 1 Peter 4, 17, for it's time for judgment to begin in the household of God. So listen, church, sin is a family matter. Protest number four, we don't know how, it takes too much time, we're all busy. I just kind of throw them all in there because I don't have time to go through all that. But our response should be, the scriptures command it, so we stop making excuses and we start obeying the Lord. What would the church of Jesus Christ look like today if we stopped making excuses and we stopped doing it our way and we just obeyed His commands? Now listen, He didn't say it was going to be easy. And sometimes it's not. Uh, th those are just a few of the protests against practicing corrective discipline, church discipline. Let me share some precautions before corrective discipline. Whenever we study Matthew 18, we always need to spend considerable time thinking about, talking about precautions before taking corrective discipline. And so we're not going to go into great detail this morning about all the precautions, but, but precautions are important. The first one is examination of self. I can't say this too many times. We're all sinners. We need to daily confess our sins to God. We need to be evaluating our lives, our, our motives, our thoughts, our actions. We need to seek to live in a manner worthy of the gospel. Each of us have that responsibility. Before we go and try to correct a brother, Matthew 7, 5 says, 
first take the log out of your own eye. Get the log out of your own eye. Deal with your own sin. Get the log out of your own eye. Then we see clearly to take the speck out of our brother's eye. And yes, we have a tendency to minimize our sins and magnify the sins of others. And so let's examine ourselves. Let's confess our sins and find God's forgiveness. Let's do that first. And then let's graciously consider the offending brother. Grace should be the foundation of all church discipline. Listen, God's gracious towards us. He's gracious towards us when we sin. He doesn't ignore our sin, but He deals with us graciously, and so should we. And so let me share a few ways in which we can graciously deal with our brothers and sisters. First of all, we need to go with an attitude of humility. We need humility for every area of life. Galatians 6 1 says, Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, if someone is caught in, if someone is in sin, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. We mess up there sometimes, don't we? We go kind of haughty. No, we should restore them with a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourselves, lest you too be tempted. And so we must take heed, we must walk in humility, lest we stumble and fall. And number two, go with the right motive. Our motive is always restoration. Our motive for going to our brother is always restoration. Notice verse 15, if he listens to you, you have won your brother. James talks about this. In James 5, at the end of the book of James, James 5, 19, My brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth or, or wanders into sin and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. That's the desire of this, is to restore a, a family member. That's what Jesus wants us to understand about this. Number, number three, see beyond the offense to the need. 1 John 4, 11, if God so loved us, we ought to love one another. Ephesians 2 says we were dead in our trespasses and sins. And when we were dead, we needed God's love and grace to lift us up out of that. And when someone's in sin, they need our love and our encouragement. We need to come with that kind of attitude. The most loving thing to do is not to let them go in their sin, but to seek to help them. And then number four, go with the willingness to forgive. Sometimes we've been wronged by a brother or sister and, and uh, we... We're not to go with vengeance. Romans 12, 19. The Lord says, vengeance is mine. I'll repay. The Lord says, here, listen, leave this to me. I saw it all. I'm completely just. I'll take care of it. Leave the vengeance to God and go with a willingness to forgive. And Jesus demonstrated, for the, uh, demonstrated this for us on the cross. For when he said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. And so we want to go with the willingness to forgive. Number five, timing is important. And this is where I failed so often. Timing. Proverbs 15, 23, how good and delightful is a timely word. Ephesians 4, 29, we're not to let the sun go down on our anger. I think Paul's point is there is that we're to deal with it. We don't put it off. We don't let the devil get a, a foothold. And so we, we take these precautions. We we examine ourselves first. We treat others graciously. Uh, a third thing we do is we pray. We, we want to go in a, a spirit of prayer. Uh, we need God's intervention as we seek to be faithful to His instructions. And so we pray for grace. We pray that we will be gracious. We pray that the other person will be receptive. Uh, that they will receive this correction in love. We, we pray for God's conviction to come upon that person. And so we certainly want to be prayed up before we go. The third main thing I want us to talk about is the people involved in corrective discipline. Verse 15 says, if your brother sins against you. So stop right there. The first person is our brother. Th this is the person who sins. 
Again, Jesus is not talking about someone who sins and confesses. He's talking about someone who sins and doesn't confess it, doesn't repent of it. And then the second person mentioned is you. If, if your brother sins against you. And so that, that means all of us. That means you and me. And it is our job to do church discipline whenever we see a brother or sister in sin. And so we, we, here's what we have. We have a brother or sister who sins. And we have you and me, the person who sees the sin, the sin that's taking place. And, 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 our, and our brother and sister hasn't turned from it. Maybe it's a sinful habit. Maybe it, it's a sinful deed. And we become aware of it. And, and we say to ourselves, man, my, my brother's in sin. And he doesn't seem to be turning from it. And he doesn't seem to be bothered by it. He's, he's still doing it. He's continuing in that sin. And so let me tie the third and fourth point together. The, the people involved and the process for corrective discipline. What's the process? We're, we're going to get to that. Uh, I can't reiterate the first step first. The first step, again, is self-examination. And I'm, I'm going to say this again. I, you say you already said this, but we get the log out of our own eyes. That's, that's so important. You can't go to a brother when you've got your own sin that you're not dealing with. You, you've got to first deal with your sin. But then the first step, Step in corrective discipline is, is private, one-on-one, one-on-one. -on -one. One -on -one. If your brother sins against you, go and show him his fault just between the two of you. Now let's notice some, some key points here. The, the offense or the sin, is, it's biblical. It's, it's not just a, some matter of preference. This, this is not some little, I, you know, we disagree about something. No, this is a, a matter of sin. Most often, this is not an isolated incident. It's not some nitpicking thing, but it refers to a brother who has been caught, who has been overtaken, who is bound by sin. And, and let me say this, the, the facts need to be present before their accusations. Now we, we don't say, well, where there's smoke, there must be fire. No, that, that's not the case here. But well, here's what I want you to notice, though. Jesus commands action. He doesn't say that it would be nice if the offended party were to go and seek reconciliation. No, he, he says, go. You all got that in your Bible? Verse 15, go. Yeah, he says, go. And so all the objections and all the hesitations and all the reservations that we have about discipline are irrelevant because Jesus tells us plainly what he wants us to do. The offended brother is to go to the offender. Now, look over to Matthew 5. I think there's a parallel hill here. Matthew 5, 23. It says, if you're offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, so you have an offended brother, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. And so in these verses, Jesus requires the, the offender to go immediately to a, to a brother whom he may have offended and be reconciled, even leaving his gift at the altar. He's almost saying more important than that gift, maybe even more important than worship at this particular time, is for you to be reconciled to your brother. God desires our reconciliation. And so I think if we put these two passages together, both the offender and the offended, they have the same obligation to go to one another. Listen, when discord between believers takes place, ideally they ought to meet each other on the way to each other's homes seeking reconciliation. Whether you're the offender or the offended... We both have the same responsibilities to go to one another. Now, you might say, why should the offended party be required to go? The offended party says, well, I haven't done anything wrong. Why do I need to get involved? Well, here, if the offended person was not required to go to the offender, many issues would never be resolved. Jesus wants every unresolved issue between believers to be resolved. 
Jesus wants every unresolved issue between believers to be resolved. Listen, Jesus wants every unresolved issue between believers to be resolved. Do y'all believe that? Yes. We're brothers and sisters. We're in Christ. We're in the family. He wants us to be reconciled to one another. Bill Gothard said, The immediate response when we see a brother missing the mark is to think, He hasn't actually offended me, therefore I'm not responsible. How many of us have thought that before? He didn't do it against me, so I'm not. Listen, Scripture makes it clear that it is the Christian's responsibility to go to him, to go to him alone. Jesus doesn't say go to someone else and talk about him. He doesn't say go tell the pastor or go tell the deacons. He Go to him. Go to the offending brother. Now listen, you, you, you might not have the whole picture, or you may, but he needs you to come. And if you go to somebody else and say, hey, will you pray about it? You're, you're just opening the door for gossip. We've got to be careful about that. And listen, it should be standard procedure among believers when someone begins to tell something about another person. It should be standard to ask, have you gone to him in person? Preacher, let me know. Have you gone to him in person? Have you talked to her yourself? And if the answer to that's no, then we should say something like, Well, I'll check back with you in a few days to see if everything's been resolved. We, we, we need to teach that. We need to practice that principle. Here's the truth many things would be cleared up quickly if we would just go alone, if we just take the first step and go to a brother. And find out what's going on. And encourage them to, to turn from that. Let me share a little scenario with you to kind of demonstrate this. Mary had not seen Jane for some time since Jane had been out of town on vacation. Now Jane has returned. Mary spots her in church and determines to say hello after service. And so we kind of got a picture of Mary over here and Jane over here. And Mary sees Jane and says, man, I, I'm going to talk to Jane after service. After the benediction, Mary hurries to the other side of the church to where Jane had been sitting. By now, Jane is on her way out the church, out of the doors. Mary calls out to her, Hello, Jane, wait for me. But Jane sticks her nose up in the air and sails out of the church as quickly as she can without so much as a howdy-do to Mary. Now, Mary can respond in one of two ways. She could say, Whew. If that's the way she wants to act, let her go. She can come to me the next time. That'll be the last time I go to her. And a a friendship can be ruined. Or Mary could understand church discipline. She could want to obey Christ's instructions. And so she might go find Mary the next week. And she might say something like this. Jane, what's wrong? I was so glad to see you that I hurried over to your aisle and called you. But you stuck your nose in the air and left church ignoring me as if I didn't exist. What's wrong? I must tell you that I was greatly hurt. And she could go to her and just say, man, that, that kind of hurt. Now, now this is a, a fictional story. But let's just suppose that Jane says, oh, Mary, I'm so sorry. I didn't have the faintest idea of what was happening. I was sitting through the service with a bad code. My nose began to run, but I left my tissues here in the car. I was afraid that since the preacher was preaching so long that I was going to drip all over my blouse. As soon as I heard the benediction was over, I put my head back to keep my nose from dripping, and I headed for the car. (laughs) And we laugh about that, but that kind of silliness happens all the time. And relationships are broken, and in that particular story, there really wasn't an offense as much as there was a misunderstanding. But just following the Lord's instructions would have helped. Most of the time, church, the process ends right there. There's reconciliation and repentance. Church, what I want us to see is that Jesus' ways are perfect if we're just willing to to follow Him. So I'm going to kind of stop right there and just say that if we take the first two steps, if we examine ourselves and if we go to a brother that we know is in sin, we would be so much better off as a church family. I just want to remind you, if you're a member of this church, you have a responsibility to watch over one another in brotherly love. 
to be slow to take offense, always ready for reconciliation with that. Listen, I didn't make that up. That's in our church covenant. You have a responsibility to one another, to watch out for one another, to be slow to take offense, always ready for reconciliation without delay. And so part of the equation implies that we're willing to receive corrective discipline when it's needed. Listen, we got some, we got some good men in this church. I want them to know that they have my permission, my, my request even, to, to come to me. If you see or if you hear of something in my life that's wrong or sinful or questionable, I, I, I want you to come. And, and listen, if what you heard was true, I, I want you to be tough with me. Now be gracious, but jerk an odd in me if I need it. Whatever it takes. And, and listen, I, I want you to know that I, I love you enough as a brother in Christ to do the same for you. Listen, let's love each other enough to go to one another when there's a need. That, that's really where we want to get to as a church. We love each other enough to go and, and deal with stuff when it, when it comes up. And, and so Jesus is saying, just look around and look around. These are brothers and sisters. We're in the family together, and if your brother is in some sin, go to him. Go alone. Go to him and, and show him his fault. And here's the promise. If he listens to you, you've gained your brother. Amen? You've gained your brother back. And so the question this morning for us is, will we be true to God's instructions? Are you willing to submit to corrective discipline from one another, and are you willing to provide it when it's needed? Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word, for Jesus, for these instructions. We know that he loved the church and gave his life for the church, and we're called brothers and sisters, and these instructions are so important. Father, I pray that we would take this to heart, that we would first examine ourselves daily, regularly we'd see the sin in our lives and we'd turn from it Lord help us first and foremost with that Lord help me confess my sins to you and Father I pray that we'd have the courage when we know a brother or sister is in sin to go to them not go to someone else but to go to them and graciously lovingly humbly help them to see their sin help them take the steps to turn from it Father, I pray that we'd see the, the beauty of following your instructions, the beauty of right relationships, and remind us this morning that you desire for every unresolved issue amongst your children to be resolved, for there to be reconciliation, for us to, to walk in holiness and purity. And so teach us this, Lord, and give us leaders and members who are willing to step out of their comfort zone sometimes to, to go. And help us individually to be humble enough to receive correction when we need it. And Father, if there's someone here this morning who's never turned from their sins and trusted in Jesus and found forgiveness, accepted the gift of eternal life, we, we pray you might save them this morning. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand and listen, if you need need to respond in some way, I'd love to speak to you about faith in Jesus, being saved. Maybe you want to know more about baptism or being a part of the church or maybe there's somebody you you know you need to go to. Don't, don't come and tell me this morning, just come and maybe pray for them and ask the Lord to give you courage and you, you respond this morning as the Lord speaks to you through his word. How deep the Father's love for us. How vast beyond our
I should I gain from his reward? I cannot give an answer, but this I know with all my heart his wounds have been. So good to see you this morning, and uh, again, special welcome to our guest. I'll, I'll be right there in that center door when you leave. I'd love to meet you again, and uh, you can remind me of your name, and uh, always appreciate that. Uh, just a couple things. Thank you for the way you've ministered to some of the families the last couple weeks. We've had several deaths recently, and just thank you for loving and being there and praying and encouraging. Continue to, to pray for those families as they grieve their, their loved ones. Uh, and in, in our newsletter, as Jeff said, there's a list of things for the, the food pantry. If you want to bring some of those in next week, especially things that might go along with a Thanksgiving meal, uh, that would be appreciated. And I'll let Brother Danny play for us this morning. Uh, I've got the same thing as always, guys. The Dollar Club, the clear box on the way out on the left-hand side, and then the offering boxes are the darker colored ones. There's also a QR code for that as well. Uh, and thank you guys also for just being awesome givers, and it's, uh, it's just awesome. So let's pray together. Lord, we just thank you so much for the opportunity to come into your house and just learn more about your word. Lord, we just thank you for your instruction. And Lord, just to help us to have the courage and, 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 the, uh, and just the will to do the things that you ask us to do. Some of them are hard, and uh, most of them are hard for, for us. But uh, Lord, we know that with your help that we can, we can do it. Lord, we just ask to lift those up who are uh, um, dealing with loss and, and, and just mourning. Lord, we just ask that we just come into those situations. And, uh, and just lift them up, Lord, and support them and, uh, and just give them some peace and some comfort. Lord, just continue to bless us. Thank you for the weather that we have outside in the sunshine. Be with us throughout the rest of um, the month and the year as we have so much stuff going on in this church. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs> 